Western Teacher Live, talking about public education, unionism and much more. Hello, welcome to a special series of Western Teacher Live, the State School Teachers Union of Western Australia's podcast. This series looks in detail at the agreement in principle regarding the school's general agreement 2020. Three. With SSTUWA President Matt Jarman, we'll be going through the negotiations thus far, how voting works, when you can vote, what the potential consequences are of a yes or no vote, and of course details of what is included in the third offer that persuaded Executive to recommend acceptance of what is now termed an agreement in principle. You can also find all of this information online. Go to sstuwa.org.au. When you sign in, and you must sign in, a large pop-up window will appear. Click on Click Here for more info, and you will be taken to all the information on the agreement in principle. Now, that's if you're a member. You will be able to see the detail of the agreement without signing in if you're a non-member, but, of course, you won't be able to vote. Uh, You can find out where and when the next information sessions are, either online or via Zoom or in person at a venue near you. You can also find a voter info, info pack, summary posters, a comparison between the claim and offers, a full voter info pack, a shorter at-a-glance guide, full details of the proposed district allowances, scenarios for seven different levels, from graduate teacher to principal, full salary tables for every role, detailed background information on on several of the offer components, and of course details on the voting process and what that yes or no vote might mean. So don't take your info from social media, from your well-informed chum who might not even be a member of the union. Do go and find out uh, for yourself. These podcasts can all be listened to in isolation, but we recommend trying to listen to them all, if, if you can, to get the full picture. We have now discussed uh, salaries. Um, we've talked about conditions, sorry. We've talked about the vote. We've talked about Bob smashing the mic with his wrist uh, and all the important things. Let, let's move on to improvements to conditions. So this, again, all of this information is supplied in your large guide um, and it's been broken down into the way the offer was presented. So the claims are made in a particular way. You might be, if your members familiar, a part of that process, the work of teaching and leading and system support and attraction and retention. So as the offer has come in, we, we've stu- we've, uh, it's been segmented into improvement to conditions uh, initially, um, and uh, we will go through that. And then there are work re- workload reduction initiatives, and there are funding-related uh, commitments. So let's have a quick uh, squiz, Matt, at the improvements to conditions. I'd like to start you off, even though it's not um, right at the top of the list, I think it's second. But I do think it's important. A lot of our members, the banners that were being waved around at the rally, etc., and also a very public commitment we made around class sizes. Now, there is no commitment across the board to reduce class sizes, I think the government put a, a, a figure on which actually related to every class having to be reduced, which was a bit misleading. But what are the gains in here about class sizes that the that, that executive finds significant, that you find significant, and that you think our members will find significant um, as sort of opening the door to a longer-term push to get class sizes mandated at lower sizes? There's no getting away from the disappointment of not getting the cold, hard reduction in class sizes. We needed, and we have been very successful, I think, across the entire membership in communicating with the broader community the importance of the complexity in our classrooms right now. That in in of itself is a win. What we have in this offer are very, very tight uh, forms of language around how classes will be configured. No more will it say we, we will consider configuring our classes. This is will. This is very clear language. Now, I can see a day when class sizes are reduced uh, in terms of their metric, and then these general agreement uh, conditions about what will be done are going to be playing off with one another. 
the number of students in the class, for example, with documented plans, which is in this offer. So, uh, yes, we did not get our, our, our end game on, to, on uh, class size reductions, but we certainly have the strongest and tightest language around class size configuration and who should be getting a documented plan and who should not be. And that is now shifted into the general agreement. So there's no hiding from it for, for any of our members, whether they be teachers or school leaders. And they are on those opening pages. I urge all of our members to read the rear attachments, which go into this very clearly. I'd just like to, to bring you back a little bit to that. So I'm a teacher. I've, I've been asked to take a class that is, uh, exceeds the minimum recommendation um, but using the current wording of the agreement, the, the department has said you've got to run that class. Your school leader has says, uh, has been told they will, not they should, but they will offer you support. What's the difference? There's, there's the word will, but, but what comes into that um, support allocation now if this agreement is agreed to? Well, we do know that... Uh, the distribution of student challenges is not often even. It's not often equitable. And uh, we also know that uh, the workload that comes with documented plans is out of control. So all of that has, has been impacted upon by the, these conditions. Uh, consultation and uh, agreement with staff, but also, um, as can be read about in the, in the booklet a little bit later on, uh, what to do if you have a situation for your classroom configuration is not agreeable. So there's a very clear appeal process uh, that is referred to in, in the new documentation that members ought to need, should read as well. So you've got class sizes, we've got documented, documented plans, how many kids have them, what percentage of, of the people have them, and then that, that support will, and we keep emphasising the word will because it sounds semantic, but will's very different to should, um, will, will be given. Um, along with that, you, your documented plans being allocated only to those kids who really, really need them uh, is significant. What about professional learning in this improvements to conditions? Because that was another area. I think even, <laughs> if I might say it, so that the people at the union were quite surprised the roar that went up when professional development was discussed at the Metro rally. Um, I think surprised a few people. It's obviously strong feeling out there. Well, what's been going on uh, within and across the system is that we've got third-party private providers coming in and effectively telling our members what they should be doing and to do it in their own time. That coupled with the concerning rise of online professional learning, which is particularly for our regional members, and this came out through in the Face the Facts consultation period as well, uh, they are being asked to do it in their own time. So they're being asked to do PL that they didn't agree to, that they don't need to do in their own time. And it's not just two or three hours. In some cases, it's hundreds of hours. And I can think of one particular course, which is 120 hours of your own time across the course of an entire year. So we, we had a variety of um, claims that members can still read in the log uh, with regards to professional learning, and they've all been addressed in bro and broken down in here. The most significant legacy matter to do with professional learning is not uh, the fact that, uh, as one of the offers clearly states, your additional online now is at your discretion, but it's the fact that the State School Teachers Union, as a party to the agreement, is now back in the Professional Learning Institute. If our members read Clause 54 of the General Agreement, they'll read exactly what the Professional Learning Institute should be delivering. And we are, of course, accusing the Department of being in breach of that agreement by not providing what it says in Clause 54. We are now back to the table where we were 20 years ago to have an instructive say as to what should be delivered to our teachers particularly, as well as our heads of department, program coordinators, deputy principals and principals and school psychs, and our casual um, staff members as well, because all of those are covered in Clause 54. So again, we, we're not going to see the fallout and the impact of that, but that is another one of these things that's in this offer that will have significant and long-term benefit and gain for, for our membership, and that was one of the facing the facts. Uh, recommendations as well. And as you mentioned, uh, just just to, to, to reiterate that, what we've done is tagged, there's a couple of questions I think people have quite rightly asked. What difference did the rally make and what difference 
did facing the facts make in terms of this? So when you go online and you look at the improvements, what we've done is we've tagged them. So if you see our um, little blue protester banner with the raised fist, those are the items that were included in an offer three. They were not in offer two. It was only after the rally took place that each of those items was added in to the offer. And it's been significant. In terms of salary, it added 1% in the middle range, if I remember correctly. That might not seem a lot, but then added up when it when you do your cumulative interest across those percentages um, and also we've got a little tag for facing the fact so in both of those uh, situations in all of these documents you'll be able to track what your actions actually delivered um, from the rally that's right and I, I want to reassure the membership that the the links to facing the facts are not tenuous we've we've had a look at the recommendations from facing the facts and what's in the offer they are strongly correlating and impacting upon those. So, uh, yeah, great job by the comms team to have them um, promoted to everybody. And I don't think you can flick through the booklet without seeing a variety of them. Oh, there's, and I, as you mentioned, 19, I think, for um, Face and Effects. And I think there's around a dozen that were immediately a result of the rally. Um, so just there are so many um, claims that are addressed in here. We'll be here all day if we go through them all. I'm going to pick out a couple which... I think quite interesting. So what you think? Long service leave? Well, the long service leave is uh, one of those claims that we've had for years. So much like class size reduction, we've been asking for long service leave for the first access to long service leave uh, at seven years for many, many agreements. And uh, we've got it in, in this one. So f again, for those uh, mid-career 2.5, 2.67 teachers, uh, we wanted something in there. We argued for it quite strongly, uh, particularly following on from the 23rd of April. So if you want to find um, a claim or an example of a claim, I would strongly direct members to the long service leave. That is a consequence of their action. Uh, for, for, for anyone in the, in the membership who is less than 54 years of age, that has impact, positive impact for you. But for our newest educators... Um, this is something that generations of graduate teachers before you long wanted, uh, and now it's in the offer. So that's, uh, as you say, another a legacy issue. Um, you pick one next. Uh, look, I think uh, we shouldn't miss out on union rep time. I mean, again, if I'm going to call out a, a few legacy matters, you know, strong schools have strong branches and vice versa. And we want to work collaboratively within our school environment. We want our school leaders and our branch reps to all be communicating regularly. And to do that in our very busy schedules in our schools, we need allocated time to do so. And that's exactly what's been won in this offer. So for my mind, again, this is something that not only the um, public education system at a local level within a school, but also the union wins from and is a very significant win. Again, another example of something that we have been arguing for for a very, very long time. And so we, we're talking at the moment about improvements uh, to conditions. There are a number that go across the public service. Uh, superannuation on unpaid parental leave is uh, one small example of that. Um, and a number of things directed towards uh, school leader performance management, for example. Well, in the last agreement, members might remember that we won a uh, consistent approach to teacher performance management. And now if we have a teacher, and we've had multiple examples of this, um, who is asked to do a whole variety of other colourful things instead of that um, consistent mandatory approach, uh, then we are able to intervene and we can do it on solid ground because it's in the general agreement. That is now the case also for deputy principals, heads of department and level three program coordinators. So again, uh, a, a very significant um, outcome across a very big part of our membership. And in terms of things that were gained from the rally, just by uh, handy blue logo there, um, internal relief relate rates, internal relief rates for principals and deputy principals. Yeah, well, it's always been scheduled, uh, and now we're talking about putting a, an actual process so it can be uh, more easily accessed. I do find that that particular one. Um, is already happening in very in many in many schools, but now it's going to be constructed into the general agreement, which is important. And I think one of those things, isn't it? This brings consistency um, across the uh, school system, where, where people are doing the right thing, but it's not enshrined. There is a chance some people to not do the right thing. 
now it is part of the agreement. Um, so we're moving fairly smoothly here on to workload reduction initiatives. Um, and I want to um, uh, mention one which I think is, is obviously extremely significant, um, and that is the establishment of a joint workload intensification task force between the union, the, um, uh, the other signatories to the agreement, but signif most significantly a direct line to the minister for it to report issues to. Um, workload has consistently, survey after survey, when we've done our state of school stuff every, every year or so, it's not been salaries, interestingly enough, it, that's been the biggest issue, by far the biggest issue, well, still important, but by far the biggest issue has been workload. How important is this? This is, this is really important. And so is this task force. This, this is not a task force that can afford to be a talk fest. So we have to look at who's causing, who's creating the work, what's the work that they're creating, and then what are we going to do about it? So the what are we going to do about it is the bit that we all want to see resolved. Well, we're going to do that through the ministerial office. This is a minister who put out a red tape reduction, workload intensification task force, whatever it is really called, report. This is not a minister that wishes to see the problems of the public education system continue unabated. He wishes to address them. So what we will ask for now is a selection of our membership to best represent the situation that we have in our public schools to the minister himself and talk about exactly what it looks like. But the three criteria that I just mentioned, I think effectively could be considered if, you know, barring some negotiation, the terms of reference, which, which is who's creating the work, what's the work they're creating, and then what are we going to do about it? Because we can no longer afford school leaders and teachers to be leaving the public education system during this period of shortage because of workload that could be mitigated or could be reduced or, or, or completely addressed. Uh, we often hear that it's work that is being constructed at a regional level or we hear that it's work that's being constructed at a school level. It doesn't really matter anymore. What matters is what we're going to do about it. And we needed a tool, and this is the tool. This is the, um, the most effective way that we could probably put it on the table for the life of this agreement so that when we get to the end of this agreement, we can turn around and say, right, all of those workload pressures that we were confronted with leading up to 2023-24 we've addressed them as the teachers' union. And over and above what we've just discussed about um, class management and, and the provision of support resources, within the workload reduction initiatives, areas that teachers have long identified, aren't they, are the management of complex behaviour, um, classroom support, trying to get small groups, um, small group tuition running with, with very limited resources. Th those are two very significant um, developments in, in the workload reduction field. Is that fair enough to say? With the classroom small support, small group tuition, I'd urge members to read the rear of the document because in, in, as far as this offer goes, it's detailed into what it would look like or should look like in a school in the rear of the document. We took lessons from how it had not gone so successfully in other states around the country and we made sure that they were built in or, or that they, we were protecting ourselves from them, which is what members will be able to read. In, in the rear. I do not see classroom support, small group tuition as any replacement for class size reductions. The class size reduction continues to be something that we will continue to campaign upon, but this initiative uh, certainly may have impact. Most importantly, the small group teacher is a fully registered teacher who is totally responsible for the teaching, learning and assessment cycle of those students. They have a liaison responsibility with the mainstream teacher, but they do not have, uh, but the mainstream teacher does not have the TLA for those students because of the registered teacher who's taking responsibility for. And it says in the attachment, and we urge school leaders to do their very best with this, try to fence these people off from internal relief pressures as well, because even though there's going to be a circumstance where that does happen, if we continue to just see these people as a, as a pool of internal relief uh, responders, then we're going to end up not getting very far. And of course, this is a group of students who are going to be identified through the department metrics as most needing that support, which will again help hopefully have a workload impact for the mainstream teacher by allowing them to focus upon the students that they've got in front of them for those periods of the week. It is across literacy and numeracy, and it, we, we argued at the table for it to be expanded from a, a range of 0 0.1 to 1 FTE, so I, I suspect the larger primary schools and the larger senior high schools will have, have an allocation of 0 0.8 to 1 FTE to distribute across the schools 
uh, school and, and that is good and that the 0 0.1, 0 0.2 is obviously for the much smaller settings. And uh, in, in addition to that complex behaviour management, it looks like additional resources being put into that? Since the 2019 agreement, the SSTU has been working um, as the only other party to the agreement um, around behaviour management and complex behaviour in particularly. One of the things that has uh, sprung out of that has been a complex behaviour management professional learning program, which is currently, um, uh, has just commenced in 40 schools. We spoke to school leaders and teachers who are part of that 40, and uh, they were very, very supportive of where it was and where it was going to take them. It comes with FTE for the schools, so to argue for greater investment in that, taking them from 40 to 192 schools is, is what we consider to be a success uh, from the 23rd of April. Um, and, it's, it, you know, this is the sort of thing that we have to invest in and we have to make sure that we're there for and we have to make sure that it works. But until we've done that, we can't really uh, judge its success. But I can certainly look upon those members who are part of it at the moment and I trust their educational instinct and if they're backing it in, then that's good enough for me. And, uh, of course, these are the sorts of things that they will be able to be monitored by this joint task force rather than just the department saying, ah, well, we don't like it, so we'll say it isn't working. Not that they do that, of course. Um, I also want to bring you a couple of significant things. Even before I came and worked for the State School Teachers Union, um, as a complete layperson, it, it, it seemed a bit strange what had happened around uh, staff placement, particularly if people wanted to go and try um, their careers or, or extend their careers and their, their leadership aspirations out into country and regional areas. Um, and I'll be honest with you, when I first arrived, that, that looked inviolate. It looked as though they were gone forever. There wasn't going to be any change um, in, the, in terms of the system. Two very significant developments, well, perhaps more than two, but certainly two extremely significant developments. Um, tell us about the staff placement issues. I think you're quite right, Bob. If you'd said 12 months ago you're never going to crack open the staffing uh, lockdown that we have in the system right now, then most people would have been in that position. But what we have here is two offers that that impacts both school leader opportunities and teaching opportunities to go out to regional um, settings and they have a guaranteed right of return back to their current spot. And as it states in the attachment detail later on in the offer, uh, the IPS principal uh, may have had once upon a time an authority to say no, but they don't under the terms of these pilots uh, for the life of the agreement. So I, again, I would encourage people to have a look at the opportunities in their career. Um, I spent 14 years out in, in regional WA and I'd do my 14 years again because it's such a wonderful place to work and teach. Uh, and lots of other things come of that as well. So we, we need to continue to find ways to chip into the staffing lockdown that we have, the congestion that is staffing. And, and these two parts of the offer are a really significant chip away at it. Good, good to hear. And, and just a little one, you, you, we get lots of these very uh, significant, broad issues. One small one that um, uh, I've noticed, and I know, again, it's been something that people have been asking for a long time, part-time principals. Tell us about that. <laughs> since, um, since the documents went out uh, last week, I've had a number of principals contact the office to, to ask how can they, how can they possibly apply. Uh, Part-time principals is, uh, we have to develop the framework and put it into place, but effectively this is about looking after those people who have contributed 35, 40 years to the system and they want to continue to contribute, but they can't maintain a five-day-a-week position or this is that person who's returning from maternity leave or parental leave. Or this is that person who's looking after a family member who's very, very dear to them, but they can't continue to work full time while they're going through that period in their life. So there is a number of different um, opportunities in here, and it is about making sure that we retain this kind of experience and wisdom and not just coldly lose it, which is what happens out of all of the class uh, that we have within our membership, this is the class who turns around the most and simply leaves because we don't have part-time opportunities for them. And uh, anything that does that obviously addresses the teacher shortage. Now, there are a whole range too of funding-related commitments. As we've said many times, getting through everything is really difficult. So I'm going to give you the, the, the um, some wisdom of Solomon here. Give me two more that we haven't mentioned that you might think are, are worth a mention with the reiterated uh, advice to go and check out the entire document because there is so much uh, on offer. 
it won't all apply to individuals, but a lot of it does. And, of course, the, the individual groups that, that get little bits and pieces all add up. Maybe performance management might be one worth a mention. <laughs> it is not fair for you to say I can only select two. Um, I'm just conscious that people, you know, have other have their lives to live. I completely appreciate that. So we we have teachers, uh, predominantly teachers, who have been through some awful experiences through classroom observation. Yet in the back of the uh, exchange of letters from the 2000 and uh, 19 and 21 agreements, we had some very, very clear explanations as to what classroom observation should look like. That now shifts from the rear uh, of the exchange of letters to the general agreement. So I would urge every teacher who feels as if they are uh, being observed outside of what those conditions are to make sure that they read uh, the response to uh, claim 13 uh, that it was for us. Look, another school leader one, I'll touch on two more. I'm going to break your rule there. Sorry, Bob. Well, I did one, so you can still have your two. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the right of return for school leaders is incredibly important to not only school leaders who want to give back to the system by taking on three-year or 12-term uh, positions, principal advisor, collegiate principal, and so on, and they can return back to that system-level position. But it's also an incentive um, as well. So the right of return for school leaders, for my mind, is very significant. And then I can't part, uh, I can't prioritise which of the district high school funding continuing for the life of the agreement continues to be very, very important. That, that first started in the last agreement when we had a massive teacher shortage and we weren't able to get full staff into our district high schools. So this three-year period provides the district high schools with an opportunity to try to get some success from that additional funding. And then the aircon uh, subsidy being extended, <laughs> the climate and, and the issues within the climate are certainly not changing at the moment, and the travel concessions uh, to the Kimberley, Pilbara and Goldfields have been very, very popular and appreciated by our members, being able to get back down to the metropolitan area or wherever they need to uh, three times per annum has made a great deal of difference in the decision to stay where they're working. So um, we didn't get those two particular aspects until the final um, offer and we did, I want to reassure members, uh, we, we really had to uh, fight for those. Uh, and I can assure you, looking, reading uh, backwards is difficult, but you can see the big logos. And I'm, I'm reckoning there's about 20 items, give or take, that came about after the rallies. So there is absolutely no doubt of the impact that that industrial uh, action had. Um, you can see photos from that. You'll see it in the next issue of Western Teacher. You can watch the video um, that was done of the uh, Metropolitan Rally. We've got photos from all over uh, Western Australia that'll be on a few posters uh, around the place and also, as I just mentioned, in Western Teachers. So the rallies not only created a buzz, but they made a huge difference. Um, I want to thank Matt Jarman for joining me. This has been a, a longish process, so if you've made it through the entire podcast in one go, congratulations. Um, and uh, you are, if you've chosen to choose segments, absolutely fine too. Um, we wanted to give you the choice of that. Please remember however you followed the podcast, that you can go and check all of this information at sstuwa.org.au because it may sound like we've been in, gone into great detail. I can assure you we've barely scratched the surface. There are a whole lot of, rec of uh, things in this offer we haven't had time to mention and there is an enormous amount of detail for some, behind some of those most significant offers. So go to sstuwa.org.au. A pop-up window will come up. Click on, click here for more, and you'll be taken to all of the th information. It is now being made available to non-members to view, but you can only vote if you are a member. You can join online as well. So, Matt, I think we'd probably like to close by thanking all of our members who, who took part in, in that action on the 23rd of April across Western Australia because they have made a massive difference. Well, it's worth asking what we would have had in the third offer had we not had that position taken from our members. We had the largest rally and I dare say we sent a shiver through the entire state government, a state government that has 53 out of 59 seats in the House. And we intimidated them into what is now just short of a billion dollar offer. Uh, and that needs to be considered when we get to the yes and no position as well, because uh, governments have long memories and they will remember 
uh, what the cause and the consequence of the 23rd of April was. So, so I think the entire membership, including all of the executive and the senior officers in this instance together, have been very powerful. And the consequence of that is that we've got a, an offer for our members to consider, which is going to go a significant way um, immediately and over the longer term in addressing the issues that we've got. EBAs don't fix everything, but they are a very significant moment of time. They've never fixed everything. And I think that we can look back on this offer and say that we've got a lot being addressed. And uh, if you're on those rallies, uh, that was an incredibly important action. And uh, the next most important or equally important will be casting your vote. So keep an eye out for all the voting details. If you're a member, please check your e-news regularly. Uh, if you've unsubscribed, you can go online and uh, subs resubscribe. Really important. That's how to get uh, the up-to-date information. And uh, the vote will take place just after State Council finishing on July 4. So keep your eye on your e-news for that update. Thank you to Matt Jarman. Uh, I've been Bob Fig, And thank you all for listening to Western Teacher Live. Western Teacher Live, cutting through noise on public education and union issues.